Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Peter, and I'm director for Triple Canopy. And along with my colleague, uh, Alexander Provan, uh, we've organized How Far Is Near. Um, Triple Canopy, as you might know, is a magazine based in New York, uh, one that encompasses uh, digital works of art and literature, uh, conversations, uh, print publications, uh, exhibitions, and the like. And uh, today's discussion is uh, devoted to the ways in which political representation might be achieved through the work of representing politics, especially with consideration to new and old media, art, and literature. That's sort of the sort of framework statement, I think, for this uh, series. Um, and today we're talking, uh, this specific session is called Universal Methods of Design. Um, and joining me is Maru Kalva, uh, who is a book designer, and with her work she explores the boundaries and limits of publication as a support for artistic practice. Uh, she is founder of Aramoto, a public library about contemporary culture in Mexico City. Uh, to my left is Prem Krishnamurthy. Uh, Prem is a graphic designer, curator, and founding principal of New York-based design studio Project Projects. Uh, he's also the director and curator of P! Exclamation point, a multidisciplinary exhibition space in New York City's Chinatown that experiments with conventions of display. And on the far left, Jose Leon Surillo. Uh, an artist living and working here in Mexico City and a contributing editor of Triple Canopy. Um, his work has been shown at MoMA PS1, the New Museum for Contemporary Art, uh, OMR, and Proyectos Monclava. Uh, you can also view Jose's work uh, here at Material at the P booth. Um, his display piece slash sculptural object houses paintings by the designer Elaine Lustig Cohen and monoprint uh, letterpress prints by designer Carl Martins, uh, which I'm sure will talk more about in just a few. So again, this conversation, uh, Universal Methods of Design, uh, is going to be devoted to the relationship between design, print culture, and contemporary art. And we want to ask in particular, how do the strategies, tools, and material histories of graphic design function as subjects and structures for artworks? Uh, how does design, or more specifically, the status of the designer and designed objects, whether advertising campaigns or pedagogical platforms, function as an analog for artistic practice? So I think there's sort of a, a broad question here, and it's, it's difficult to talk about this sort of, um, the kind of tension between art and design, uh, often what is a productive kind of tension. Um, uh, but also to be able to kind of distinguish between our experiences of art and design. Um, and I think likewise develop a vocabulary for talking about them. I think a, a lot of the ways in which maybe we describe our own practices or the projects we're producing um, tends to be uh, very hyphenated, uh, including many sort of slashes, um, as if to suggest a, a kind of merging but not quite uh, complete um, uh, merger of the two. We're going to maybe start by talking about uh, the booth here at P, um, which is a particularly great example as it ties together so many different histories of design and practitioners. Um, and so maybe uh, Prem or Jose, maybe I'll, I'll turn to you. Sorry about the technical difficulties, but that's always part of the fun. Um, anyways, um, so just to say a word, to s a starting point, for me, and perhaps for Jose Leon as well, could be the booth that is C1 over there, which is a project that is a kind of unusual for me. I mean, the interesting thing for us was to try and create a situation that collapses certain questions of design and display and authorship in something that kind of uh, in some ways confuses and maybe breaks certain boundaries that are typically considered to be um, kind of in place within the presentation of artworks. And um, I encourage you guys to take a look at it because in a way it probably does a better job of explaining any of this than I'm gonna do right now um, and is more nuanced. But there, there, there it is. Um, I mean, the idea was it started from a kind of prompt, maybe I'll say a word afterwards or it'll come up in the discussion, what P is and how we function. I'm gonna move over to the side for a moment. Um, but, um, the idea was to try and put together three 
artists of very different generations and backgrounds, um, and to have them interact in a particular way. And so the three artists are Jose Leon, um, and then Elaine Lustig Cohen, who is 88 years old and was is was one of the most important graphic designers in America working in the 20th century and also one of the few women working in the field at that high of a level, um, but who then turned to art making, uh, had a kind of, um, made important works in the 60s and 70s and on. She also ran an important bookstore, um, which is maybe also interesting in this context, called Ex Libris, um, where she kind of distributed and sold um, mostly early 20th century avant-garde books and was really the first person to do that in the US. Um, and um, so there's Elaine Lustig Cohen and Carl Martins, who was the, um, who is a designer who's 75, based in Holland, and who started a school called the Werkplatz Typography, the typographic workshop in Arnhem in Holland. And Carl is really interesting because he's worked since the 19, early 1960s as an independent designer on his own, working mostly on books and printed materials, though also on larger scale signage projects and things that have to do with architecture. And he has a really direct approach to graphic design, which is hands-on and involved in the actual materiality of printing and kind of how things are made. Um, and the idea was to create a situation that's not collaborative, and maybe we'll talk more about that. I don't think of this as a collaborative situation, um, and, and I say that quite polemically because collaboration is a buzzword that's often used um, more and more within corporate contexts to kind of efface power structures. Typically, collaboration means that, like, you know, when you have Nike collaborating with an artist, um, it's like, what does that mean? Um, what are the kind of power structures and economic structures that are implied in that? But I would say that instead, it's a kind of uneasy dialogue, um, or, or it's a kind of conversation, because in a way it started with these two, with these three artists, and then um, P, me speaking with Jose Leon, and presenting the idea of showing these works together. And Jose Leon, I, I'll, I, he can speak more to this, but his response was immediately, well, what if, we, what if I were to make something that's both a sculpture and a kind of display, um, something that both has its own kind of uh, presence as an object, as an artwork, but that can house these works in a particular way and that um, kind of is custom built for these works. And so the works exist in a kind of, in at least two different stages. Like on the one hand, um, on the left you see a sculpture called Environment One, which is Jose Leon's work, which is consists of this uh, stainless, the, this um, polished steel structure that is custom built for these three vintage paintings by Elaine Lustig Cohen from the 1960s and 1970s. But at the same, so that's all one work, but at the same time, they can also be separated out. It's also still four works. So there's a kind of sense of something being both one thing and many things. And the same goes for the second piece with Karl Martin's work, which is a kind of vitrine and shelf that's deconstructed that also contains these monoprints within it. And so this sense of something being on the line, rather than it resolving clearly into kind of one thing or another is quite interesting to me. And, and I mean, because I think that within the discourse of exhibition display and exhibition design in particular, I mean, exhibition design has this kind of was, uh, to, in a kind of very shorthand way, I think in the early 20th century, exhibition design was a really fruitful, uh, fruitful place to kind of produce things. A lot of artists like Frederick Kiesler and uh, you know, other people working with display were interested in the kind of interaction between artworks and their environments. And at a certain moment in the 20th century, the, that kind of strand of inquiry disappeared for the most part within a more mainstream art discourse to be replaced by the discourse of installation art, um, uh, which then became about the autonomy of the artist to create an entire environment. And um, so I, f I think that nowadays, exhibition design within the art context has a really bad name, um, oftentimes. Uh, but what I'm interested in is a place in between where something might be a display, it might be design, but it's, and it might have a kind of artistic gesture, but at the same time, it's not clearly resolved into so-called autonomy in one direction or another. This thing about autonomy, I think it's important also to understand that, um, I mean, yeah, the point you bring up about collaboration, I think, is a good one. Because collaboration, in a sense, always tries to maintain the, auto the autonomy of each collaborator, um, or, or if not to announce each, col each collaborator within the work. Whereas the idea here was actually to efface this autonomy you know, and, and make, make, make each work sort of um, kind of impossible to exist by itself, no? or, or in a sense, be, have the final product be 
absolutely necessary have to have the, the, the three components. Now in this case, uh, Eileen, Carl, and, and my work. And it's also important to, to, to note out that it's the same structure for both the Carl and the Eileen. It's just that one structure is on his side and the other one is, is standing up. No? And the thing about, I think, about exhibition design is that sometimes exhibition design could be more interesting than the work itself, but it's usually, um, it's usually viewed as something that's supposed to be invisible or as a backdrop for, for the work itself. And the idea here was to somehow actually make it incredibly present to the extent that it would fuck up the work a, a bit. It's, not, it's, like the, it's impossible to see the Eileen paintings without the structure, and it's possible to see the Eileen paintings without the back of the painting, which you're usually not supposed to see. Anyway, it was just a little. Um, I, I believe uh, there, there's like three topics on the table, no? which could be one, like this idea of collaborative or, yeah, collaborative work or collaborative work, or I don't know how to say. And I believe in, in that sense, like trying to, to bring back the main idea of the table, which is kind of this relationship or boundaries between art and design. I think a lot of times like um, we can try to think that art is different from design in a way of its collaborative process, no? Designers usually do collaborations uh, to make their works with clients or with other designers or with artists, no? Uh, to make a book, you make a collaboration with the artist and then you, you, you make this design uh, con conclusion, no? In, in that sense. And in, in that case, I, I believe that, um, in this specific case, I believe that in that sense, design uh, responds to, to the need of, of linking public publics to the art pieces, no? So in this case, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't want to say that this is a design piece or an art piece, yours, but I do believe it's a, it's a way in which you can link these art pieces, which are also design, no? This, Carol Martins and Elaine are designers, to, to the public, no? In, in that sense, I, I think this is kind of uh, trying to make the designer more of a of an author than a problem solver or a form giver, no? So you, you think of the designer also as, as, as an author, which is... And, and I think it could be interesting also to think of design as another form in art, as opposed, of, as opposed to putting it versus art. Like, I think it's actually important to talk about design now as a new form within art that, that, that can be used as a form. I mean, the list of artists that sort of employ design as a, as a specific tool is endless, no? Um, and in this particular case, it's, it's, it's sort of reverted because it's, it's showcasing artworks done by designers, like professional designers, no? I wanted to ask, I mean, again, um, going back to Mauro, like your comment about the public specifically, um, you know, as a book designer, probably when someone encounters a book that you've designed, um, more likely than not, they're picking up a book or that book in particular because of the the artist or subject or work under review, right? So they're saying, oh, this is a book of so-and-so's work, um, you know, designed by Maru. Um, but there's kind of like perhaps almost an inverse. And maybe this just has to do with my own subjective opinion or, or relationship, you know, to, to you, Jose, that, um, it's, it, it occurs to me, obviously, that someone could walk up and say, oh, this is Carl's work, and, or this is Elaine's work, um, and there happens to be this other structure, right? Um, so that point of contact with the public is, is maybe um, the moment um, in which um, who is subsumed by who is kind of defined, right? Um, it's very much dependent on, uh, I guess, reception is what I'm, I'm asking. Can I jump in there? I mean, I, I, I sadly, I don't yet know your work that well, Madhu, but I'm looking forward to kind of understanding it better. But I would claim that when you say that most people picking up a book that she has designed are picking up for the artist, I, I think that that's a, 
It's hard to say, but I would think that that's probably not quite true because, in fact, I mean, as we know, design is a mediating force. Design, like the presentation of a thing, whether it's environmental, like what kind of space a thing is shown in, or it's uh, what kind of architecture it's kind of uh, exists within, or like what kind of form and typography and scale and materiality this thing takes on is essential to how that's read. So, I mean, there are cases where you might pick up a kind of badly designed book by a really famous author and be like, great, but I would imagine that knowing what I know about your work, that there, it's more likely that somebody might pick it up and be like, oh, that's an artist I'm interested in, but they're like, that's a really interesting book, too. That's a great object. And, and, and I think that that is exactly the thing. Like, design doesn't always kind of, and has not historically announced itself always as an authorial force, but it is always a mediating force. And one which, I mean, actually in the kind of more and more corporatized world that we know, for better or for worse, people understand more and more the value of branding and like what, that in fact, even if that's a thing that most people don't recognize as being an object of inquiry, that actually that kind of invisible or quote unquote invisible mediation is actually the thing that accrues value. And I think that for me in particular, and maybe this is where it becomes not necessarily authorial, but to me kind of more visible is the question of a kind of Brechtian juncture, like a juncture at which design or display becomes apparent as such. And people kind of, it's inescapable that there is not a kind of neutral condition, but rather that every, that within any given situation, there are multiple actors, there is the space, there is the kind of typography, there is everything within a kind of context is actually influencing the erratic value and the kind of economic value of an object. Also, in the way of lack, because design can also be talked about in what it chooses not to present, as if design is always based on like a phantasm of what is not, what, what is not design. Yes, I, I do believe, like I was uh, formed as a graphic designer uh, at school, and it's true that it, when, what, when you're at school, it's like you as designer have to be neutral, no? You have to have no specific uh, voice, as an author in a piece of an artwork or a book or whatever. But I do believe uh, this is not such uh, anymore. Like when you, I, I brought even a publication uh, that might uh, start a kind of discussion about that. This, for example, is a publication uh, we made for Abraham Cruz Villegas artist, and as you know his work, uh, he, he uses like all this uh, material of, like recycled material, no? So he made this uh, place like to make a pedagogical project uh, with material that he took from a demolition he was about to make his home, no? And so they asked me to do the, the publication, which is a small publication, like it had to be cheap, no? There was not a lot, enough budget. But in the end, uh, this publication, uh, we thought about it and we, we thought, well, how, how, can we make, uh, how can we make a statement with the publication? So in the end, the publication was printed uh, on, ¿cómo se like on paper from the printer that was uh, trash? Uh, make ready. No, that's already printed on or? Yes, that, like the printer has this paper that is caught, uh, caught in like, like they want to throw it out. But it's left out, okay. no? Yeah. So the publication was printed on left out and, um, and in the end the format of the publication and the boxes of text and all, it responds to this uh, economic uh, idea that Abraham had with his own piece, no? And the, um, the binding of the book has no staples and it's like bounded only by folding and whatever, no? But in that case, I do think that the design, the object that we have here, like the book, does make a statement that, I don't know if it helps or not, but it does make a statement of a designer in a work or in a piece of art, which I think happens here with your, with your, desi with your design while you try to make a talk or conversation with Karen Martin's work or I with uh, Abraham's work, no? I do think that's possible in the end, trying to make authorship 
like skip boundaries of, of an art piece, no? Mm -hmm. I mean, Prem or Jose, do you want to talk a little bit about the kind of the the dialogue maybe that you you feel you're having with with each designer? Is it a conversation piece? Well, no, the funny thing is because I actually view it in quite the opposite way. Like I think to a certain degree, it, it sort of hinders this, this idea of a possible sort of third outcome in, in a way. Um, th there are many links. I mean, it is, there is sort of a layered, perhaps more in, in Prem's mind because it was, it was Prem's idea to sort of join the three of us in one particular way. So I don't know if it's a question that you have. Prem, are you the, are you the true author Much of this installation? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just, I, I, I think of myself as, yeah, a person who puts together situations. Um, I mean, and, and maybe, I mean, I mean, I could say two things. I wanted to make a comment about what you said. I wanted to just like throw in the polemical kind of statement vis-a-vis -vis the title of this um, panel as well. Um, and then I could say something quickly more to that. But to Mara's statement, I mean, yeah, when, when you said like in school, you, you know, you're, you're supposed to be neutral. You know, you're supposed to make a thing that's neutral and functional and kind of fulfills the need of a given context. And I mean, I would claim that, you know, and, and the title of this being kind of universal methods of design, I mean, to be quite polemical for a moment, I mean, I think that the, the moment in which we kind of really think about neutrality, particularly within graphic design, is of course in the kind of post-war period of the 50s and 60s within Swiss graphic design, German graphic design primarily, as kind of representing some sort of quote-unquote universal approach to communication. And I think that it's really important to note, and of course many other more kind of um, historically grounded people than me have said this before, but the fact is that those quote unquote universals were made for you know, white people in Europe. They were made for a very, very homogenous audience, and so one could claim universality as being a certain mode. And of course, even the aims of those design systems were, um, they were economical, they were to kind of make printing and production more um, kind of feasible and less kind of time consuming, um, which is where even the idea of a kind of new, a layout, a grid comes from, essentially. All of which are, not, I'm not saying that those are bad things, but they came out of a particular historical moment in the post-war period. And so it's like that version of modernism um, is kind of one that's, and, and, and I mean, it's indelibly linked to pharmaceuticals and to like the advertisement for various kinds of corporate concerns in that moment. And so I just think that obviously we're in a moment where we recognize that those things are no longer neutral and there, there are different ways in which design agency might be expressed. Agency is a word that I like to use a lot. Um, and sometimes it's more authorial, sometimes it's more mediating, sometimes it's more coordinating um, or even instigating. It's a thing that can bring things into the world. Um, all of those things may belong to design or may not belong to design. But I think that that question of, of those contours is quite important. Can I say one more word to something? Maybe, can, whoever is doing the slides, can you switch to the next slide? I mean, I mean, I will say that, I'll say like maybe a word about P and something that um, is quite intrinsic to our approach. Um, you know, we are a kind of space in New York that's interested in these kind of awkward situations, these multidisciplinary situations where people who, people and objects which might never meet in the same room are put together. And, um, and I think in particular we've actually weirdly, I mean, that's been a mode that has come across in booths that we've done at commercial art fairs, which is unusual, because we are a space that's a commercial space, but also a kind of project space. We're interested in a hybrid model. Like, for example, this was a booth that we did in NADA in 2013 with Karl Martins and um, Aaron Gemmel. Can you switch to the next slide? Where the idea was that you had two things collapsed into one place, a kind of set of historical and contemporary works, but with a work by a younger artist that literally broke as you walked on it and was then used to produce new prints from it, new, mono, new monoprints. And so there's this way in which these two artists work, which is quite disparate, is put into one space, but it creates a kind of something in between it. Can you skip to the next slide? Um, or like a situation also with Elaine Lustig Cohen in Nada in New York, where the artist Heather Rowe designed a booth that involved Elaine's work and her own work. And so um, Elaine had always had this kind of 
idea that her work could be architectural. She worked with a lot of major architects like Philip Johnson and Richard Meyer um, in the 1960s and 70s. And so her, a painting of hers from 1967 became the ceiling of the booth. And Heather created a kind of mirrored situation that's very hard to photograph where when you walked in there was a third corner and this tiny booth kind of became a dialogue between two women artists of different generations who are both interested in the vocabularies of architecture and design. Can you skip to the next one? Um, and then here, for example, in the gallery in P, um, a kind of exhibition with the work of Elaine and the work of Heeman Chong, a kind of young Singapore-based artist who's interested in the legacies of graph design and typography. And again, they're like, and he designs, he makes these paintings that are like kind of fictional book covers. And Elaine is very well known as a designer of book covers. So you put these two things together and treat them as if they're footnoting each other and people would walk in and say, oh, is Elaine making paintings of book covers now? And there's this kind of way in which you suddenly switch up what people's expectations are and you have two audiences. You have a kind of hardcore graph design audience who comes and thinks about a contemporary artist working with the legacies of graph design and vice versa. You have people interested in a young Singaporean artist who come and are exposed to work from the 1960s and 70s, that's very different. It's the double-edged sword that I'm interested in. And can you skip quickly to the next one? And the next slide? So, and, and I mean, I think that sometimes those systems, it's like interesting because graph design is also a way of thinking about structures and creating porous structures, I think, is an interesting one. This was a show that we did at P with an artist named Kit Yi Wong, who is a Hong Kong, New York based artist. And she invited a feng shui master that she had worked with for a while to come and read the space and tell us what the space needed. And his recommendation was to make the ceiling green because he thought that that's what it really needed and to choose all the artists based on the artists, uh, a list of artist um, birthdays. So it's a different system. Using feng shui as another system for ordering space that can rupture the kind of typical modes in which one thinks about curating because curating is usually a kind of thesis-driven act in which your job is to kind of prove something in an expository way through an exposition. But in this case, it was to actually introduce another structure, which might also be a kind of valid structure for organizing space. And I think that finding those kind of porous systems that are not universal is precisely what I'm interested in. Um, maybe uh, we could talk a little bit about the kind of different context. I mean, Prem, you just uh, showed a couple different um, installations at art fairs um, in addition to the gallery. And um, it seems like, you know, on a sort of global scale, the kind of um, maybe the discourse between art and design is, is also being played out at the level of the art fair. I mean, maybe it's a pertinent question, obviously, because we're all here. And Mauro, we spoke yesterday um, about Zona Mako uh, specifically. Um, uh, and the ways in which sort of modern art was separated from so-called contemporary art, from so-called design. And I'm wondering maybe um, uh, how you all feel or why you all feel maybe those distinctions are, are upheld um, in the context of like the commercial fair um, and maybe the ways in which you kind of seek to, to disrupt them. Well, in general, the idea of a fair is always sort of topological. No? And I mean, the fact that they're done in these huge convention centers is also, I mean, they have, they have to be organized somehow. And the thing about Mako is also that now, like, it includes a large furniture section. Like, a, it's like there's like an actual industrial design next to art, next to art that then is, of course, divided with modern art and contemporary art. Um, but... In the end, I, I, I don't think there's, I mean, what would be, what could be the, I mean, it's still a fair. My, my, my question is, what could be the, 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 the possibilities in, within a fair structure? No? I mean, I don't know if there's, if it's that interesting. Look, I mean, clearly there are stakes, maybe, yeah. But I mean, oh, I for believe... Example, something, something like what Prem does, in, in the end, it's much more interesting to me because it, it, it does, I mean, it includes the, the topological differences within the fair, no? And 
and within the within those implied structures, like he, there's a new there's a new thing that's that's being proposed in a very sort of subtle way, perhaps. No. <laughs> Do you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, it was really interesting because um, at Zonamako, I mean, the kind of you could totally the difference between the design section and the main section was so interesting because you have like the design section. Every booth really does use exhibition design. It's like all red plush interiors. It's like everything is a kind of interior in an environment. And actually, I mean, in some ways, I think that that's the that's the typical critique of exhibition design from the kind of art. Um, direction is that it overwhelms the individual objects um, in lieu of a kind of totalized environment. And I mean, I think that one can trace that critique of his exhibition design in particular back to um, the roots of exhibition design in kind of uh, ideological and propaganda exhibitions of the 20s, um, uh, like the kind of all the famous like Lizitsky and um, L. Lizitsky's kind of uh, exhibitions that were propaganda exhibitions and how that carries itself out. But the trade fair is an ideological method. Um, the trade fair was really a method for distributing nationalist ideas. Um, I'm not making a point yet here, but I'm kind of ruining. No, but I, I mean, I think it's interesting also to think that in the end, or like, you know, after after modernism, exhibition design became the sculpture, or exhibition design became, as you say, installation, in in a very sort of um, direct way. You know, it's like you got you got rid of what it is that you were displaying and presented the display structure itself as the sculpture. No. Yes, but I don't believe in, in fair specifically. Exhibition design is very ex exploded. You know? so, uh, it's more like a shopping place. No? So you, you have these white, small white cubes uh, that are not, as, not even similar to a museum uh, space, even if it's white and cube. No? <laughs> but, I, but I mean, and I do believe, uh, yes, of course, it's design, the design part of the fair is going to be super different because design follows different objectives wh of what art uh, follows. I mean, art is super, I, I do think, even if, if they travel together and they can be partners and friends, art and design, I do believe they, they, they respond to different uh, objectives or ideas, no? So, uh, could, I, I, I think so. I, I mean, maybe this is the polemic part of the table, but I do believe it. It's no, different, no? Well, I think, I know, it's a really good point. And actually, it's, I mean, this is a really obvious point that I'm sure everybody already knows, but it just crystallized for me. That, of course, those two different, let's say, to set up a kind of false dichotomy, but to talk about the way in which design is displayed, say at Mako, versus the kind of way in which art is so-called art is displayed, it makes clear what the agendas of each of those different forms of display is. Because in the in the kind of design side, the agenda is to create a kind of immersive environment that convinces you that you should like buy this chair, or you should buy this kind of particular piece of design because it's like really cool and like it gives you a sense that you belong to a certain lifestyle and like that maybe maybe your living room, you could also have a red living room sometime and then you could change it next week. Whereas on the art side, what it's trying to present to you is the autonomy of the artist and the individual artwork. It's trying to say this artwork is, I, I mean, I think for the most part, like the kind of discourse of the wet white cube is that it's trying to say this is a kind of amazingly valuable object by an artist who is a genius, who is solo and autonomous, who does not work within a collaborative structure because they are outside of the norms of society. And this object itself is unique, it is rare, it is scarce, and you're gonna take this home and rather than, it's gonna go into your home that doesn't look like this art fair, but instead of it going into your home, um, and then it's, it's gonna go into your home in this very different way because you're gonna take it out there and then you're gonna change your whole home. You're gonna make your home a white cube so that your home then can house this genius object. I know I'm being polemical, but I'm saying that those are the agendas, I think, in terms of the different displays and what they're trying to convince you of, rather than, like, there's, there's something there in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll disagree. Why not? <laughs> I mean, one of the questions I had was about um, whether art, like design, can exert control, which is a very specific phrase I'm trying to, to, to throw out there, whether art, like design, can be said to exert control in the public sphere. And it seems like in these very controlled environments, we're ascribing uh, 
a lot of power to the art object, of course. Um, and um, but I'm wondering when you sort of get beyond that, uh, does the balance shift? Um, in other words, like um, when uh, uh, when we're say. Uh, what, thinking about, I guess, like a major touchstone, obviously, for um, uh, for a lot of artists, writers, and designers in Mexico, being like the the Olympics and the sort of total system, uh, the 1968 system that were was put forward, um, that also employed art objects and and sculptures and um, to varying degrees. Um, but you really get the sense that, um, as far as the 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 public's engagement. Um, that uh, design is sort of calling of the shots. Is that? Yeah, and I mean, it, it, it also employed, I think, the model of the world, like a, of a world expo, no? where like the city suddenly became uh, the, the venue of a huge overpowering design structure. No? Everything from the metro to posters to uh, exhibition cartels to specific artworks. Things that are actually are still in place, you no, know, like sculptures, etc. Um, but but what's left of it is a bit of a it, it's just like a like a reminder of failure to a certain degree. So of course the the the, the tension initially with design and totalizing control, specifically in Mexico in '68, can be read through the killings of '68. Um, which would be just, again, if we talk about the phantasm in design, like that's completely the phantasm that was powering the, the whole design structure. No? Um, but even now, like, I mean, you think of La Ruta de la Amistad, which was also for the, for, for this, for the Olympics, um, that, you know, has these massive sculptures all over Periferico, and they, they, they stand as testaments to... to, to, to Failure, really, no, in in an urban sense. Um, I don't know if that really goes with your question, but about. I believe the the '68 design, Olympic design, uh, made by Lance Wyman. Um, it was uh, a design that tried to transcend or. Yes, come on, try to break language barriers, no? which was a, in a context very specific as Mexico, no? with a lot of uh, analfabetismo. And uh, so this is why like, the, the, the design was made uh, like this, and it appropriated uh, from vernacular imagery from Mexico, no? and the witchol weaving traditions and all of this. But I, what, I, what I find most interesting, besides the official Olympic design, would be the appropriation of the of the student of the student movement of this design, no? Which in the end, it is a design that tried to explain or make or make the world believe an idea of Mexico, which you might think, yes, it's it's now like a remembrance of failure or whatever, but in the end, I I think in terms of graphic design, what I find very interesting of that specific context is the, student, the students who appropriated the design to make their own political propaganda to try to speak the same language to the same public, but to, but to say com a completely opposite message, no? Instead of this Mexico of the future and, no? This Mexico of, of uh, repression and, and, and in the end, I find that the appropriation of design, which is, I think, what Prem was saying of quoting and quoting and re-quoting, uh, I think that's what, what's really interesting about that specific context for me, at least as a designer. Awesome. Do, you, do you want to say, I mean, since we're uh, lacking images, do you want to describe a little bit um, more the, the specific like, instances of appropriation um, or any images that uh, that come to mind? Yes, well, basically what happened uh, to give a context is, uh, as you know, well, the 68 uh, Olympics were very amenazados, amenazado, threatened by, uh, I mean, the whole spectacular scene was very threatened by the student movement, no? 
And as you know, what happened with the students and the Matanza de Tlatelolco and all of this. And so in, in a sense, I mean, as you, I think, might have in your head this Lance Wyman, white and, and the black lines, uh, very spectacular, no? And in, in a way, I think it's, it's interesting that this design is super spectacular. In that specific context, I, I believe, but it's a very personal thing, like to kind of cover up, uh, kind of cover up what was going on, no? But in the end, what, what, I, what I, I am thinking of are these posters that, what, that were made by the student uh, printer, printing uh, workshops that took the Lance Wyman's design and other designs from Mexican artists that were more, in, the, in that sense, materi the material were uh, silk screening and uh, grabado, no? L you know, grabado, I don't know. And um, in the end, they, they just changed words. I mean, in the end, just to try to give you an image of it, it's like the Lance Wyman design, but with the words changed in the opposite and uh, to make a political statement. I'm sorry, I, I'm super bad to explain images in English, but uh, basically, perdón, perdón. I love that, that's awesome. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I, uh, it would be great, I mean, it would be great to see those images if we can find them somewhere, but it's like, I mean, I think the thing that that points out, that's, that I think your, your comment is super apt, is, is that, okay, the locus of power is always shifting. And the point is that at any given moment, it's not like a single discourse of design and art or whatever, these individual strategies. It's, I mean, and here I sound like a Foucauldian, but it's like, it's like, you know, it's basically at that particular moment, the thing that represented kind of state power and a certain kind of um, overarching idea was the, as you're describing it, is the 68 Olympics, is that visual identity. And so that becomes a kind of the powerful hegemon hegemonic thing, which is then essentially subverted by somebody appropriating that. And at any given moment, there is this kind of shifting mode of what's the kind of thing that's in power that can then be used or appropriated or challenged in a certain way. And so, like, you know, in that particular moment, it is design that's actually the strongest kind of visual force. In another mode, um, there might be other either visual visual modes or economic modes or other systems that are actually more prevalent and design might become something that is far more of a, a kind of either an underdog or have a different resonance. And at any given moment, it's about shifting what the focus is. Um, but I, I, sorry, that was not a very articulate way to say that except to say that I think that your example is really interesting. I would just like to add like uh, this idea of, of image making and remaking is a uh, it's a very central uh, part of of, pow of of experiencing power no? in Mexico. You can see it now with the government that we have now. It's this image uh, on top of image that tries to convince you to something. And I would only like to add that what I think of this student movement and the and I think it can be thought about it now in 2015 is. Um, the idea of, com of community, in that case, the student movement, the community and, and being solidary uh, versus the imposition, no? which was in that case, Lance Wyman's design. So it's imposition against community and solidarity and brought to design, I think. Okay, gracias. I mean, Jose, do you want to uh, say a bit about the kind of uh, the images and symbols and visual language that um, uh, often become sort of repeated like motifs in your own work? Um, I mean, in the same way we're talking about the student movement sort of um, appropriating the, the language of symbols um, uh, in Wyman's system for the Olympics. Um, uh, I see like, um, uh, obviously, a lot of uh, those same um, uh, uh, visuals, visual reference uh, uh, resurface in your work. Um, really? But no, actually, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk Before. about, um, okay. I mean, it is related, but it's not directly answering your question. Um, because I also think it's good to talk about things that we all have in mind. 
in this case would be the booth. And I like to, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a serendipitous thing for me because I didn't know, for example, that Eileen had been here uh, in the 60s and was somehow, and, and repeatedly, uh, and was apparently very influenced by exactly Lance Wyman and all the graphic sort of system of the subway, etc. cetera. Um, and she has a whole series of X paintings, um, which the X in you know, Mexican history is loaded with significance uh, since uh, pre-Columbian dis designs, no? and then the, you know, the name of Mexico with the X. Um, but there's actually been times where it's been wanted to be removed, but it's been kept because it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the graphic um, representation of post-colonial in, in the name of, Me of Mexico. So, so even that is a, is a design uh, um, situation. No? And then, of course, the relationship with someone like Pedro Ramirez Vázquez, which is a totalizing architect in, in Mexico. Um, you know, he, the X for him is super important. It, it comes out. The X has a national symbol. No? It comes out in, ev like, even, like building design, from building design down to, like, uh, tabiques, like, floor designs and things like this. No? So, so this relation with, with Eileen sort of maybe, I mean, conscious or unconsciously somehow reappropriating the idea, the graphic idea of the X, no? Um, and turning it into a system, because in, in a sense, it's, it's, it's just a system for paintings, no? It's like you pare down to, to one specific um, symbol or, 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 or situation and repeat it to, yeah, and to the nth degree. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically just pointing out that that was somehow something that seems important yeah. in retrospect as a graphic symbol. This is kind of a vapid comment, so it's like somewhat unfocused, but it's like what I'm, in, what it's interesting is because I'm just responding, and I'll keep it brief since it's so unfocused. Um, the Lance Wyman question, like, it's interesting because from I'm, I'm very aware of my own position as a kind of New York designer thinking about the 1968 Olympics and thinking about, and not knowing the history in a kind of deeply researched way, just kind of knowing it and thinking of it as, you know, quote unquote, the one of the most successful graphic systems of all time, you know, um, but then being aware of it having a different resonance here, also kind of other ways in which historically it has been appropriated, what its legacy is, the historical conditions of the 68 Olympics, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the other hand, like this kind of, so there's like this interesting, not just dis disconnect, but disjunction between my own associations with that and what it means for that moment and, and how it's read here. And then similarly in the opposite direction, like, like I think it's really interesting that you see that X in Elaine's work in that particular way. I'm sure that consciously at least that was never a kind of question in her mind, um, but it's not really about what's consciously. And, and so like that has a kind of, in my mind, a kind of relationship to the kind of historical moment in which it was made and hard edge abstraction and like kind of graphic design of that that moment and modern various modernisms but the interesting thing is that I don't think that either of those is kind of invalid it's a kind of inversion and this kind of way that you like the the status of the object in its reading kind of keeps shifting based on the position from which it's seen and when it's kind of translated in the metaphorical sense to a viewer and made accessible it's it's the, it's how the future can help the past yeah. I mean, maybe, uh, again, this is being a little polemical, but drawing a, a sort of connection between um, uh, uh, art and design, but also the X as sort of like a, a repeated image and, um, and also what we traditionally think of as, as kind of being like a logo, right? Um, they have a different kind of currency. And I don't know, Mauro, if that's something you maybe... You what, what was your... Can you repeat? Because I didn't... Uh, I guess I'm wondering about the difference in uh, thinking about the kind of currency and value, the sort of distinctions between um, the kind of images that are maybe repeated in your work, such as like the X, which we're talking about now, um, versus the way we think about a logo as deployed by a designer. Are there, is there a valid distinction to make there? Yes. I mean, yes and no, but... 
I think the, a logo encompasses, I mean, the idea of to, to repeat, the, uh, to repeat a symbol or um, a motif in work, or specifically for me, is always to sort of, to, to somehow efface through sort of repetition. So it's difference and repetition within one symbol, whereas a logo would do the contrary, you know? The logo chooses to always um, communicate the same thing, which it, in a sense is a brand, you know? So the logo brands, whereas repetition in my work perhaps, um, seeks to di di differentiate the thing itself, you know? I mean, would you make the same distinctions as designers? I, I guess I'm drawn to thinking about the question of branding and distribution of a thing versus scarcity. I mean, maybe coming back to the question of the art fair um, and the context of, of the context in which um, the scarcity of a thing, um, the fact that a thing is rarefied and exists as a unique object that can only be owned by one person, like kind of generates its exceptional value versus the conditions in which the, like which even, you know, going back much further, like the kind of distribution of a religious icon um, kind of enhances its value. Um, and, and the number of times that the Mona Lisa is reproduced in textbooks um, or online kind of increases its value as well. And thinking about kind of internet scarce, like the, the idea of like, I'm now going in a totally different direction, but I'm just thinking about the kind of art fair model and the kind of rarity of a thing versus, you know, let's say the Rijksmuseum putting high resolution images of their works online and what those different value models are and whether it's about, I don't know, how the kind of ownership system works, but very open-ended. I'm just trying to think through that right now, so maybe somebody else can say something. No, and also, I mean, maybe the question is also the similarities and differences between a logo and a symbol. I mean, because a logo can be a symbol, but a symbol doesn't necessarily have to be a logo. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe, Prime, your comment about the, the Rijksmuseum's website is a good segue into um, maybe thinking a little bit about digital technologies and, and the web specifically. Um, I mean, I think we're very interested in these sort of questions around um, whether digital technologies have solidified or weakened um, the distinctions between art and design. Um, I mean, it seems impossible to, to have, say, um, uh, a, an experience of art in a kind of digital context, be it you know, an, an e-book or a website or uh, a mobile app um, without design. Um, yeah, not only that, and also art that is, like its main, or one of its main goals is to be distributed through the internet, you know? Or d art that is really just made for the internet in that sense, so. But I think maybe that links to what I was trying to say earlier about the possibility of thinking as design as form. I mean, I don't, I don't know if, if, if it's clear, maybe it's not even clear f for me, um, but basically not, what I'm trying to say is like not having having it be this, um, you know, it, it's a very old um, contraposition of design versus arts. Like it's it's always put one against the other, um, and perhaps now what we can do is, or, or what we should think is that. In, or, I'm, sp I'm talking specifically on the art side, no? Like within art that. F design can be appropriated as a form, or used as a form, not even appropriated, like, um, like honestly used as a form, without being ironic or um, trying to be critical of it. No? Well, I think, I mean, it's an interesting point that essentially, what, the point you're making, if I understand correctly, is that in the kind of current moment, um, it's impossible to not be aware on some level that we're experiencing these things in a mediated form because we're experiencing them through an interface of some kind, um, which I think is an apt comment. I guess I wonder whether that's really just the effect of our particular historical moment that in the same, like, it, in, and this is a kind of very dumb and uh, analogy, but you know, obviously, um, you know, in the moment when 
uh, in, the, in the first moments of movable type or in the moment of any given kind of change in the way in which things are for presented or formed, that thing seems new and people take notice of it for a brief moment and then at another moment it becomes totally invisible and that mediation once again gets pressed down because it becomes a norm and it becomes something that is invisible through its ubiquity. And so, I mean, it's kind of nice to think that maybe we live in a moment in which people are more aware of the mediation of art by being JPEGs that people kind of put on a Tumblr, but actually like already I feel like we're moving into a moment in which people no longer, a lot of people don't think about the distinction between a kind of painting on the wall and a painting that's you know traded as a JPEG. Mm -hmm. You wanna respond? <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's like a very important question. I mean, I just, I guess wonder, you know, for each of you like as practitioners, is there, is there promise in that, right? Like, I mean, it's a very interesting moment because the conversation's like so legible, the interface is so legible, but I mean, we all know that when the interface sort of fades away, well, that in and itself is, is a kind of uh, fallacy, right? That's never actually the case. Um, there's always uh, a degree of mediation, a degree of control. Um, uh, you know, whether it's, again, this context of the art fair uh, or the White Cube gallery space, um, you know, or your iPad. I think the problem is thinking of it as a possibility or, or as a promise, because, I mean, there, there, is no this, there is no emancipatory thing coming from it, I think. Because if you do expect that promise, I think it's doomed to fail. So there, 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 there must be like a new shift within the interface. Do you want to respond? I mean, in a weird way, I'm having a kind of, personally, I'm having almost like a kind of, and I wouldn't say it's a conservative turn, but a turn towards the idea that, in a way, focusing on the interface, which is something that P has always done, is itself a kind of, it's a particular moment that has a particular purpose. And so, for example, at the gallery itself in New York, we're gut renovating it right now and it's going to become a white cube for six months with the idea that it then becomes a white cube that presents eight exhibitions within the course of five or six months. So it kind of takes another logic and speeds it up. But there it's like, it's almost like, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the graph, the design magazine Emigre, which was a really important kind of graph design magazine in terms of discourse in the late 80s and 90s and um, famously had this kind of radical revolutionary design that used digital technologies and new type faces in particular ways, but then it was maybe, I don't know what issue it was, but there was an issue of the magazine where the editor, Rudy Vanderlands, kind of came out with this editorial where, which was really controversial in the design world at that particular moment when I was coming of age, where he said like, you know what, uh, actually what I'm interested in now is like the content. And I, um, now when I read the uh, manuscripts that writers send me, I read them in 12 point Helvetica, Helvetica. And so this issue, instead of being in like 15 different typefaces is going to be set in one typeface in a single size. And, um, and it was like a kind of big moment, but it was also to say, you know, now, you know, we've been focusing on the interface as it were for, you know, a decade or a decade and a half. That was really important because those forms were themselves kind of radical forms, but now those same typefaces that Emma Gray made in the late 80s and 90s were being used by Burger King, you know, and were being used in all these contexts that no longer had anything to do with their original purpose. And so rather than kind of continuing to beat that dead horse, they kind of moved on and said, now we're going to commission, we're really going to focus on legibility, we're going to focus on the content there and having ideas within it that are actually just as kind of radical or interesting as the design was earlier. I mean, and I'm glad in a way you brought this back to print um, because I think, I mean, too often we readily associate uh, the term interface with kind of digital design. But um, Maru, like in your work um, and specifically your project between utopia and failure, um, you seek to kind of uh, encapsulate like a number of conversations um, through the design system that you create, um, through the books, through the exhibition design. Um, as a way, I would, I would guess, of sort of, um, you might say, coaching um, or, or leading the, the reader, viewer, whoever she may be, um, uh, uh, through those dialogues in a way that um, 
maybe maybe offers some sense or some some empirical understanding uh, of of um, of those dialogues. Yes, I believe in that case. Um, design respond in, in that specific case, like design response to to this idea of being uh, one of the of the possibilities that Prem stated. No, the design tried to be in that case a mediator for for this pedagogical system uh, between a pedagogical program and art. No? So in that case, design was like in the middle of, of that. And in a, in a way, it was trying to seek a very common place of language that could be understood very easily. And then in that sense, uh, with, the, with the icons and the publications, etc., it was basically that, I mean, like a, a, a point of, of encounter, no? a place where you speak a language and you speak of art and you, uh, but he's maybe a, a person who doesn't and how do you make them conversate? That was basically it. The designer as a mediator in that case, or translator to say. Yeah, I mean, I like that notion, that idea of like design in the middle. Um, uh -huh. That design is a kind of mediator between the 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 audience that you that you maybe hope for, right, and and the the creators themselves. Did you have a sense of like what the audience, who who would comprise the audience for the project, um, and and the books and other parts of it that uh, of the system that were dispersed? Yes, no. In that case, I mean, it it was a, a specific. A pedagogical program that took place in three or four specific encounters, but in the end, it was decided to to become also a publication that could, in a sense, document what had happened. So, in the end, the pedagogical, the pedagogical program um, kind of grew besides that specific moment when those four people were together. So in the end, when you see the publication and you read the publication, you have the sense that you are part of the program too, that you are part of this pedag alternative pedagogy too. Uh, that, I would say, might have been the most interesting uh, point of what design could complement to this specific project. No, but it, it made it happen afterwards, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the, to, in this question of print, which I think is important too, I mean, one of the things that design has traditionally done, has done for a long time, is through the, is the role of publishing and the role of printing and the role of distribution in that way. I mean, I, I would point here to, you know, it's like design in the middle, design as being a kind of, uh, a, a practice that can encompass many forms, but that can basically pull together people into a kind of group or team or however you frame it, um, who then can produce something together. And I mean, my partner at Project Projects, Adam Michaels, just started a publishing house called Inventory Press. And that is really a kind of way to take the kind of, let's say, the knowledge of like production and distribution that we've amassed over the last decade and also the kind of networks that we are involved with and the collaborators and the people that we are in dialogue with and trying to kind of create a different structure for how those books can be produced and can be put out into the world and I mean and that kind of role of the kind of publisher designer is a really old one and one that I think is kind of important to remember again. Maybe in that I would say like the also the exploration of the form, you know, in the, in that specific. If if it's possible, I I I think it would be interesting. Uh, there's this uh, text by Bruno Munari, which is super like typical and, but there's a paragraph that I think has to do a lot with uh, what Prem was saying. If it's possible, I read it. It's super short. Yeah, please. And it's it's in the designer's art. Uh, chapter <laughs> and it it's it's funny because this was written in the 70s and and I believe like it's what we're talking about now in this table as if it's like the New yes like what are we going to do and if you read this this two paragraphs you you realize like 
where are we and why are we still searching for this same thing? So if you let me, if it's possible. It's called Design as Art. And it says, today it has become necessary to demolish the myth of the star artist who only produces masterpieces for a small group of ultra intelligent people. It must be understood that as long as art stands aside from the problems of life, it will only interest a very few people. Culture today is becoming a mass affair, and the artist must step down from his pedestal and be prepared to make a sign for a butcher's shop if he knows how to do it. The artist must cast off the, large, the last rags of romanticism and become active as a man among men, well up in present day techniques, materials, and working methods. Without losing his innate aesthetic sense, he must be able to respond with humility and competence to the demands his neighbors may make of him. The designer of today reestablishes the long lost contact between art and the public, between living people and art as a living thing. Instead of pictures for the drawing room, electric gadgets for the kitchen. There should be no such thing as art divorced from life, with beautiful things to look at and hideous things to see, to use. Uh, if what we use every day is made with art and not thrown together by chance or caprice, then we shall have nothing to hide. Anyone working in the field of design has a hard task ahead of him to clear his neighbor's mind and all preconceived notions of art and artists, notions picked up at schools where they condition you to think one way for the whole of your life without stopping to think that life changes, and today more rapidly than ever. It is therefore up to us designers to make known of our working methods in clear and simple terms. The methods we think are the truest, the most up-to-date, the most likely to resolve our common aesthetic problems. Anyone who uses properly design objects feels the presence of an artist who has worked for him, bettering his living conditions and encouraging him to develop his taste and sense of beauty. So what I'm trying to say here is that I think it's a kind of uh, wrap up of what you said before, of this idea of, um, I think I should not even make an argument of this. I think this is, I mean, this is explained perfectly. I'm sorry. I don't think there should be more to say about that specific topic. Sure. I mean, I'll just throw into that that it's, it's always a kind of, it's a systemic question as well of what is valued in a given societal structure. Like uh, I, I'm thinking, for example, very concretely of the situation of design in East Germany in the post-war period, where interestingly, graphic design was accorded a place, uh, graphic design was often considered more important than painting or sculpture because the thing that was of value, at least within that kind of economic and ideological structure, was um, how public it could be, how many people it could reach. And so, um, you know, graphic design from the very beginning in East Germany in the late 40s, early 50s, had a place in the kind of official council of the visual arts in East Germany. And uh, again, at times was considered much more important because a poster was a thing that could be distributed and a poster was a thing that could reach people. And so it just so happens that we live in a particular moment in context in which the thing that's valued is how much money you have and, and kind of what one's social status vis-a-vis um, -vis economics is. I believe in that, in that case the, that design uh, started being, like when you went to an art museum, you, you, there were no more, all, oil paintings, for example, and conceptual art started, and fluxus, and, and the situationist, and all of this, which I believe in the end was trying to make, to make art more closer to the public. And of course it has to do with design, but it, it didn't. It was only, like conceptual art had, had kind of uh, this relationship to design, but it was not so, and why did they start like leaving away the traditional art techniques in, in this, the Germans and like, was it, my, my question would be, was it um, a way of approaching the public more, like conceptual art and this, or was it something else? 
I think it's also like a, a well-known fact, um, particularly in American uh, conceptual art, that the way, you know, with Seb, like Seb, Sieg Seb Siegler, the dealer, coached the public on, um, on what conceptual art was and how he sold it was appropriated from uh, the language of advertising. And, and so in this way, it, was the, it works the other way around. So in a context of art, you know, in order to make the art piece function, it was function with an appropriated discourse of design. You know? Cool. Um, I should mention that um, we're, we should open up to questions, perhaps. Uh, does anybody um, want to ask? Uh, or, com or comments. Or comments, or anything of uh, the participants? Or polemicals? Complaints? Rants are also welcome. Hi, I want to know if Prem could, would talk about the double agency concept he shared and, and the problem of the design and, and curator. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is even building on just what we said. I mean, it's interesting because we 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 had we kind of ended our statements with a kind of very ideological. I mean, a very idealistic kind of mode of like, yeah, you know, and and I don't and I don't want it to also sound like like I'm like yeah, design in the socialist state, design in East Germany in that moment, everything was amazing, you know, like you had, so so there's there's kind of a way, and we're doing this in an art fair of all places, um, um, where we're absolutely participating in um, all of these kind of rarefied economies that we claim to critique. Um, I mean, I think that the question of double agency, and, and I don't know if you're referring to, I guess I, I mean, there was a moment in which I gave a couple of talks about, like, that were called double agency, just about the question of, um, I mean, what's interesting to me is that I don't think that there's a kind of um, dialectical or kind of purely separate relationship between these kind of critical ideas and the market or the kind of realm of design and art or kind of curating and design, but rather that one has to see these things as different spectrums in much the same way as I think about agency within a given context. Like I think that there's a tendency, and I think a lot of this has to do with the necessities of branding, the speed at which we move, the ways in which objects and um, and ideas accrue value where we want to simplify things where we want to say like well this is a thing made by this person and we want to kind of like simplify we want to say this artist with a studio of 50 people is a single person who made this thing um, and it makes it easier for a lot of reasons whereas I guess I'm interested in the fact that it's never that easy there's a situation always where um, as I said before, like there's both a context that has to be taken into account, which might be a physical context or a kind of economic structure or, or a social one um, that is an actor within it. There may be people who have agency as artists. There may also be people who are mediating, such as curators or designers, and that all of those kind of different levels of agency together end up producing the thing that is then experienced by a given set of different publics. And so um, in my role, I mean, I see myself as kind of trying to do as much as possible as I can to shift between those things. Like sometimes at P, I am the director of it and I'm really like there as a director of a tiny, like what I call a mom and pop Kunsthalle on the Lower East Side, like trying to go out and raise money. Sometimes I'm a curator putting together an exhibition. Sometimes I'm just the exhibition designer. Sometimes I invite artists or other people to do something and I literally just like make SketchUp models and design press releases, which is super fun too. So it's kind of like my interest personally is in a fluidity of those roles because I think that actually they all allow for these different levels of dialogues whereas if I were to claim one of those roles as a singular role it would kind of then lock me into being like okay now I'm a curator now I put on my curatorial hat and I'm much more interested to do that plus the other thing because I think that they're more interesting conversations that come about. Um, it's been a really great thanks for sharing it's been kind of valuable to hear all this the crazy, precarious, in-between state of design and art and the efforts being made uh, within culture, within different geographies and how those do connect and don't connect are kind of really interesting ways of 
perceiving all this, but um, I guess I, I, I think about how a certain re-education has to happen, either for students as they're entering school, graphic design, art, um, and so I find that to be like kind of a really important aspect to all of this, because obviously uh, you guys are produ cultural producers within a business and industry already, but then there's all these new kids kind of going into education and they're being educated in certain forms or not being educated in certain forms. So I wonder about how what you're proposing gets implemented into educational um, platforms. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing was just um, in terms of these kind of elements of haunting, hauntings, like this kind of phantom, um, the invisibility of design or exhibition, um, that I found really interesting as well, and how uh, design, if it emerges as kind of this authority that frames art, um, how that kind of produces this kind of strange, uncanny, element to the experience of viewing art um, that I find really also really interesting, but um, in a way that's kind of also optimistic. So there's this strange uh, mixture of uncanniness, but also optimism, and maybe that also stays in that realm of in-betweenness that seems to be emerging within the conversation. Um, and as it's just like a layman viewer of art, as I enter, say, the P exhibition, <coughs> I unfortunately would assume it's all one artist, unless I obviously investigated and um, sought out more information. So that's also kind of another layer to someone that doesn't know. Um, this assumption that everything is this unified unit within, say, exhibition, may it be in a gallery, a fair, or um, some other situation. Um, which is then just speaks to kind of a embedded way of how I experience art or situations in terms of just like the single author. Unless it's like, it's a collective or there's text that's just like um, mediating my situation pretty quickly before I enter. So they're both, it's just, I guess they're just various comments in terms of uh, different points or topographical moments as I'm hearing you guys speak about all these things. Um, that's about it. Maybe we want to begin with this question about um, education, like the education of an audience or uh, education most directly, like in the classroom. I mean, I guess for me, I, I, that I've come back to that because I think about sort of like what you, um, um, again, not to sound like oh, overly optimistic or idealist, but what you, what you hope for your audience, right? What you want for them. I mean, maybe, and, you know, in your case, it's it's for um, someone who's sort of um, just just coming into these discussions to um, see the possibility of wearing you know multiple hats, um, to put it one way, rather than subscribe to one specific identity or, or mode of production. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess I could say that for me personally, in terms of education, I mean. At the moment, I'm teaching at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard. And that's interesting because I've always taught before in design programs and taught within design, graphic design programs, tried to teach a kind of broader sense of what design is. And now it's interesting because I guess I'm kind of on the other side. I'm in a curatorial program trying to teach the curatorial students about design. And it's quite interesting because I think that it's a discourse that hasn't been explored as much directly there. and. Um, and I'm finding it really productive personally, and I think the students find it productive, um, which is to say, like, there is this relationship, like, to think about exhibition histories, to think also about, like, how everything as basic as, like, wall labels and typography is also a curatorial act and involves the mediation of things, and to think about those things as being quite um, involved with each other. And in a way, I guess if I had a goal in that class and then the things I've been teaching, it's to say to the curators too, at some point in time, you're gonna probably work with designers um, in one form or another, and here are some ways to think about that as being not a kind of purely kind of hierarchical, like at the end of the process, I'm going to involve a designer in it, but actually maybe more interesting things can come out if there's a dialogue that is like kind of happens in a more originary moment. Um, but I'm gonna contradict myself as well, like because I'm, I'm like both interested in this like kind of multiple agency, and I think any situation is by fact, a kind of situation of multiple agency, whether or not we kind of perceive that or not. The flip side is like, I'm super, when you talk about the uncanny, 
like I'm the uncanny experience of viewing art. I'm so enamored, like many of us, and this is a contradiction, in the kind of myth of total authorship. But like when it works, it really works. Like like I saw last week, I saw the Pierre Huig show in LA, and there was like this moment that is for me always my favorite moment. It's only happened like a handful of times, but where you're in an exhibition or a situation that's so totalizing that you see something that probably doesn't belong to the exhibition that was accidental, but you assume or you kind of have a moment where you're like, is that part, I mean, I'll actually just tell this in another way. Can I just say one other thing? This is a kind of off color story, but it's not that bad. No, I mean, I remember years ago, I went to the Museum of Jurassic Technology um, in LA, which I'm sure many of you know. And I went there for the first time and it has all of these amazing exhibits and displays that kind of play with the production of knowledge historically and in the kind of museum institutional context. And some things are broken, some things work, some things are fictional, some things are real. And, but you believe this total kind of construct that is a fiction, that is a narrative, that is the Museum of Drastic Technology. And then at the end of my visit, I go into the, to the bathroom and I sit down on the toilet and suddenly there's no toilet paper. And I'm just like, oh my God, he got me. Like, oh my God, it's part of the piece is that there's no toilet paper. And like, there was this absolute moment in which I believed in the absolute kind of consistency of that as being part of this artwork. And so, I mean, maybe that is the myth and maybe that's why we still do this stuff because there is the idea that, and of course that's meant, that's, uh, there are multiple people involved in that. Pierre Huy's show has like multiple people and curators involved in it, but still, and some level I don't care because it creates such a total world that it suddenly makes the world around me seem like it's more interesting and part of this kind of construct. And so that's the opposite of everything I've said so far. To follow up on, on your comments about the booth, that you thought it was all one artist, I think that's actually really good because then it worked. Um, go, go, linking it back to the beginning of the talk, we were talking about a, that this was not a collaboration. If it would have been a collaboration, it would have been very clear that these things are separate elements in one sort of mode of display. But it's actually good that you thought it was one, one whole thing. Okay, going once, going twice. All right, Prem, Jose, Mario, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Brett, Material Fair, and to all of you for uh, joining. Um, I should mention that uh, a transcript and possibly also a recording of this conversation will appear in Triple Canopy magazine. Um, so watch for that. And uh, tomorrow's conversation will take place uh, same location at 1 p.m. And same time? Noon. Okay. So we'll see you back here, Brian. Thanks again.